Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to today's uh, special webinar on adaptive technologies and P2. Um, this is a re-recording of the event that we ran on Tuesday, March the 24th at 8.30. Uh, for those of you that joined us, you would have known that we did have technical difficulties uh, during that session as we had uh, 920 people join us online. So we were completely overwhelmed by the interest and apparently our technology was also completely overwhelmed by everyone joining us. So I want to give a great big shout out and a major thank you to Kim, Chris and Michael for joining me again today so that we could do this recording. And after today's presentation, uh, Kim, Chris, and Michael are going to reflect on the experience that they went through and the lessons they have learned. So just another value add to today's webinar. So let's get going. My name's Amelia Shaw. I'm IEP2 Canada's Executive Manager and IEP2 USA's Event Coordinator. On behalf of IEP2 Canada, IEP2 Australasia, and IEP2 USA, I would like to wish uh, you a sincere welcome. We know that we are all living in really different times right now. COVID-19 has had an impact on all of us, both personally and professionally, and we want to sincerely thank you for joining us and for also continuing to help us as, as, as we manage during these times. We've had a lot of people reach out to IEP2 offering resources, offering their time, such as these wonderful webinar presenters today. So thank you, thank you for joining us and thank you for joining us in difficult times. As we get going, I would like to uh, do a land acknowledgement. We are coming to you from East Souk, British Columbia, and we acknowledge with respect that it is on the ancestral land of the Lekwungen speaking peoples on Southern Vancouver Island, signatories to the Douglas Treaties of 1850. Their traditional connection with the land continues to this day. We know that we traditionally have people from all over North America and the world. So I'm going to ask everyone that's listening to today's recording to just take a moment and acknowledge the land and people uh, from where you are from, the communities that you are in. So now on to adaptive technologies and public participation, session number one. So I'm going to start with my introductions. Kim Hishka is the principal of Dialogue Partners and a believer that she just about that just about anything is possible with a little dialogue. She's on a mission to chart a different course for public conversations better conversations that open possibility, cultivate collaboration and spark change. With over 10 years working in the field of engagement, she has developed a passion for designing and facilitating conversations that matter and creating engagement experiences where participants feel valued. Relationships are built and initiatives and projects move forward. Along this journey, she's made epic mistakes, has accumulated a host of errors and a suite of failures to share. She'd like to believe this doesn't make her less than, but better for. When she isn't facilitating sessions on complex issues or leading workshops to support others do the work she loves, you'll find her being an imperfect wife, mother and friend to, who is gr pretty grateful for all that life has to offer. She's joined by Christian Malali. Chris is a vice president at Hilden Knowlton Strategies and is a leader in integrated communications and public engagement. She has 15 years experience in public relations, public participation, strategic planning, facilitation and research and is passionate about partnering with clients and communities to have meaningful conversations that build trust and inform stronger decision making. Previously, Chris was Vice President of Strategic Communications and Public Engagement with the Canadian Public Relations Agency and has worked in communications with the Government of New Brunswick, Halifax Regional Municipality and SOBEs, as well as leading projects in many sectors from the arts to major infrastructure and, and international development. Both Kim and Chris are joined by Michael Sauvé. Michael brings a wealth of experience in communications, public engagement, social media and digital marketing strategy, and advertising program management. A specialist in campaign design, planning and optimization, Michael works across all sectors and speciality areas to support H&K's content and digital strategies and works in close collaboration with H&K's creative studio. A former academic, 
researcher and teacher, Michael has a passion and aptitude for identifying and understanding and solving problems for his clients. Michael has worked on political yeah. advertising campaigns and for a boutique marketing and analytics agency in Ottawa. A very big welcome to Kim, Chris and Michael. And now I turn it over to you, Kim. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I'm going to show my screen. We're going to do a little bit of dancing here so that we can get all of our information ready to go. I'm going to check with my colleagues. We can see my slides. We can, Kim. Thank you. Excellent. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're just going to take one more moment. I always have this thought around when I hear these bios, these very professional bios. It doesn't necessarily tell you much about the person behind the bio. So we're just going to take one quick minute uh, to tell you just a little bit more about um, a little bit about who we are, but maybe more importantly, what are Chris and Michael and I thinking about related to how do we engage in this context that we're that we're in right now? I know sort of top of mind for me, the the challenge that I see is I love being with people and I love interacting with people and I love the bringing together of people. And so I'm fearful around the loss of people being together. And yet on the flip side, there's this incredible opportunity to step into online tools in a way that maybe we never have before or never have been pushed to before. And so really that's where, uh, that's where I'm coming from on this call. Chris, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk a bit about the challenge and the opportunity that we're seeing. Well, hi everyone. It's wonderful to join you once again. Uh, by way of background, I didn't start out as a P2 person or a communicator. Uh, actually, my background is in science. And the, the opportunity I saw there was that uh, we weren't doing a particularly good job in the field of science at communicating or um, informing people in a way that they could really participate in a meaningful manner in decision making. So that was the beginning of my path uh, to participate in consultation and P2 work, and it's evolved over these years. Um, but I'd say, you know, in this current and challenging context that we're facing, the big opportunity for me, and I'll look at it that way rather than a challenge, is to consider how we can expand this work into the digital space. So many people are spending so much time online um, and are looking for information and are wanting to make connections. Those connections will be different uh, than they would be in an in-person space, but I think they still can be um, impactful, they can be rich, and this is an opportunity to explore how uh, we can bring good practice that we've, we've exercised in person to online spaces and maybe to connect with a lot more people than we have in the past. So I'm excited about sharing our ideas and uh, responding to some of yours. And Michael, any opening words from you? Great, thank you, Kim. Um, I've been invited to, to participate in this session as a digital specialist, and I think it, it bears mention that I'm not an expert in P2 practice. Uh, or even a practitioner of, of public participation. Um, I have, however, worked with a lot of organizations in public, private, not-for-profit sectors, and have helped a lot of them launch uh, an online part of their business or, or undertake some part of their digitization journey. And I think what's exciting is perhaps the wrong word, but what is important about reaching out and doing this type of work under these circumstances is it really forces us to double down and, and help perhaps strategize how we can reach people where they are right now. There's some easy ways using existing channels, and then there's some other opportunities that might be slightly outside of your comfort zone. But the biggest opportunity I think here is to, to take the plunge and use this moment um, to your advantage by experimenting with and adapting in the online space to enrich your practice. Of course, not trying to, uh, to do anything radically differently, but to, to see what the digital uh, can lend to the practice. And I'm gonna be speaking from my expertise outside the P2 space and invite you to, to follow me in the parallels I'm making, but don't take my word as law on P2. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. 
uh, everyone, so here's where we wanted here's where we wanted to get started this morning. Um, the picture that you see in front of you uh, is the reason that we're all coming together on 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 this call. It's a it's an image of COVID nineteen or the virus COVID nineteen, and so there was a couple things that we wanted to say uh, or we wanted you to start thinking about as you're stepping into this choosing tools for online engagement or figuring out new and different ways to engage in the online space um, is that we really want to know that people are going to be coming from a variety of different places at this point in time and so some people are going to be really comfortable engaging in this time and there are going to be people who are going to be very uncomfortable engaging in this time and so we wanted to offer on the outset of this that likely in whatever tool you choose you're going to have to meet people where they're at in the state that they're at we're likely going to have to sort of dare to jump in and talk about things that matter to people as are um, in addition to what's happening right in front of us and then just be ready to dance in the moment and shift and change as we as we need to Chris, is there anything that you wanted to offer sort of as the you know big picture thinking that we wanted to offer? Well, I'll put this out there, Kim. Um, there are certainly no silver bullets or simple solutions. If there were, we wouldn't have nearly a thousand people uh, signing up for these webinars. So completely appreciate uh, the need. Um, but we'll, we'll challenge us to, to think about you know, yes, the tools, and we'll we'll explore that a little bit. Some of the the tools that we have some experience with, um, and certainly it's been helpful that IEP2 has been crowdsourcing uh, wisdom from all of our members, uh, what they've used, what's worked well, what's been affordable, what some of the challenges have been uh, for various P2 activities. So um, we're gonna start at a little bit of a macro level, I think, on things to think about, but then we'll drill down and answer some of those questions about how to evaluate uh, the tools that will do the job. Um, and certainly, you know, as we think about the context that we're in, we're at a bit of a pause, a wait and see, in this moment today as we're recording this, but I think we're starting to contemplate what a new normal might look like. And that's gonna be, you know, very soon, um, where all of our organizations may be, you know, waking up a little bit more and, and asking ourselves what conversations are appropriate uh, to be engaging communities on and how to do that um, in a sensitive manner. So uh, we're gonna look for cues uh, to give us an indication of, of when, it's, when it's right the right time um, and on the right issues, and that's going to vary based on uh, local circumstances, geography, um, what's happening in the world, the subject matter. Um, but that's you know the the context that we're in and what we're thinking about as we uh, as we walk you through this today. Thanks, Chris. So everyone, we know that uh, following our first following our first webinar, or even leading up to our first webinar, there were many, many like hundreds of questions that came in from people. And so we wanted to just offer a couple of things here as way of introduction to answering a few of those, or maybe not answering, but putting some ideas out there around how we might uh, move forward. One of the biggest questions that everyone, I feel like it's the top of everyone's mind right now is, should we even be engaging right now? And if we do decide to engage, when is the, when is the right time? There are also some of these questions about, you know, a bit of fear and worry about, well, we can't do what we've always done. So can we even still keep going? Like what, what does engagement even look like if we don't have face-to-face -face available to us? And then what are some of the approaches that we should be using or what are some of the considerations that we should be using in implementing meaningful engagement in the digital space and so these are some of the questions um, that we're that we're hoping to talk about or and for sure ignite a conversation amongst all of us in this space to start talking about some of these things so that we're bringing together that wisdom from across I'm just going to spend one minute here just on this question of should we or should we not be engaging? Chris touched on it, and I'm just gonna build on what she had to say there, everyone. Uh, I said yesterday that isn't this the $10 million or $100 million, whatever, it doesn't actually matter. This is the question of our profession right now, is many of us want to offer 
thoughtful, reflective, appropriate conversations to community or stakeholders or participants. And, and can we still do that? And if we can, what does that look like? To build on what Chris said, she talked about, we're going to have to be looking for social cues. You know, what are we seeing in the online space? What are we seeing in our communities? Um, are we still having press releases from our major um, political leaders every day? Or are those maybe starting to taper off? We're going to have to be looking for those moments and those cues of when are people ready to talk about something else? I also think that there's an opportunity to um, let's use some of our IEP2 core values, one of which says that we should ask people what they need in order to participate. Maybe there is an opportunity to interact with our community members or our participants on if we were going to move forward in engagement, what does that look like and how would we go about doing that and what would you need in that space in order, in order to do that. And I think when it's all said and done is what, what Chris said, I'm just going to reiterate it one more time. There is no right answer. There is no just do this and everything will be okay. Rather, this is going to be a coming together and figuring it out as we figuring out as we go. So I'm going to turn it back over to Chris here, everyone. There was a couple of perspectives that we wanted to offer to get us thinking about choosing the right, uh, choosing the right online tools. Mm -hmm. And as we, we worked as a presenter team to explore these questions and figure out what would be most useful in, in offering you know, um, a way forward, a bit of an aha moment for us was, you know, while this is a completely different landscape we might think you know going digital and perhaps we've experimented with it we've um, deployed some tactics but we're really having to double down in that space much more than we've had in the past um, we felt a bit comforted actually when we realized you know what so the landscape is different but our roadmap is still very much the same the planning processes that we would uh, use to think through what success looks like uh, most importantly define that what success looks like um, is the same exercise uh, understanding who we want to connect with uh, what we want to talk about why they care about those issues you know, will lead us quite naturally to exploring some of the tools and tactics and opportunities that are going to let us connect with those important audiences where they are um, in the online world. And so in some cases that might be, you know, small working groups using uh, a webinar tool like this, and it will mimic um, to a large degree the kind of experience that we would want to create in a room in person. And Kim's going to talk more about that. Or in other cases, um, you know, given the context and everything else on people's minds, maybe it may not be the right moment or opportunity on a particular issue to try to go deep. So maybe we try to go broader um, and we use uh, social media as a perfect example as a way to share more information to get people thinking and to, you know, participate more at that perhaps consult level. Um, so, you know, it, it um, again, I'll reiterate our planning process holds, uh, even though it does feel like it's a totally different environment, there's a lot of tools and options at our disposal. And as per usual, you know, one tool or tactic isn't enough. Um, we always plan our processes contemplating multiple ways for people to participate um, and that's true of the online space and again there's lots of opportunity to do that and Kim's going to expand more on this as we go um, but let's always you know challenge ourselves to ask the question of what kind of experience do we want to create for our participants because if yesterday's uh webinar is is any indication i think we saw even with a very friendly group of fellow practitioners that when there's friction uh, or frustration in that experience of engagement um, it, it impacts you know uh, the overall the overall um, opportunity to engage people in the conversation and to, to, to have a good outcome so um, if we start with thinking about the experience of the participant I think it leads us to understanding uh, what some of the the preparation involved might look like and uh, how we can troubleshoot even in the moment uh, and learn as we go to ensure that uh, we're continuing to uh, to do this work as well as we can in this new environment. 
Thanks, Chris. Now I'm just checking Amelia here for a moment. We know that uh, we wanna make sure we're doing this the best that we can. Would we like to turn off our webcams, Amelia? Could you just let us remind us if that's something we'd like to do at this moment? Yes, if you could turn off your webcams, um, because at the moment, the only person that we are seeing is Kim. Uh, with our go-to webinar technology, uh, we can only record the uh, video cam of the individual that has the presenter screen. So that's why some of you might have only just been seeing Kim. So we're now gonna shut off those video cams so that you can see the screen in its entirety. And we'll come back to the video cams, or we'll certainly come back to the pictures of our presenters in a few minutes. Minutes. Thank you, Kim. No problem. And everyone, just to say this right now, these are questions as you're moving into those online engagement spaces. And later, you're going to hear me really, you know, encourage the use of video. These are the kinds of questions that you're going to be wanting to talk to your potential providers about. You know, what's the experience? What can you have on? What can't you have on? Um, and again, those are going to connect to what are the goals, what are the, um, what are the goals or what does success look like? Which is gonna take Chris and Mike here, or sorry, Chris and Michael here are gonna spend just a couple of minutes uh, talking about what are some of the things that we need to think about when we're choosing tools? Because we know that there are so many different tools out there, what do we need to actually think about when we're making thoughtful choices here? So Chris and uh, Michael, I'm turning it back over to you. Thanks, Kim. Um, as Chris has said, I don't think we can think of moving into the digital space uh, in order to affect good P2 practice as a simple change of venue. It would be nice if there was sort of a one-to-one -one analog for everything you did in real life uh, that worked just as well on the internet. Um, and in fact, one thing that some of the great questions yesterday pointed out is that a lot of what we're talking about um, does, necessar does necessitate the internet and um, access issues are going to be something that that needs to remain top of mind. There are certain advantages to the digital for um, broadening access to the consultation or uh, information process. We can do things in a lot of different ways, but that is that's something that um, that we we take for granted a little bit is access to internet. Um, there's certain things we can do using um, smartphones um, or text messages, but really um, that's that's sort of a baseline here. Uh, and if we can't do that, what else are we going to do? There's no tool that stands in for the internet and that's that's a difficult thing that we're, we gotta line up against. But if we are working in the digital space, um, we need to make sure that we're lining up engagement strategy with the channels, platforms, um, content and tools and calls to action that allow and encourage response and participation. And that means doing things in, a, in an online way. In real life, just like on the internet, it's very rarely love at first sight. And so um, being prepared to reach out to people and perhaps segment to a greater degree to whom we are reaching out, right? And um, we're able to balance different groups based on demographics and psychographics. And um, if we're looking to inform people, as Chris has suggested, social media is a great way to let specific groups of people know what we're up to and to invite them to, to join us in a consultation or join us in a collaboration. But of course, as we've seen with, with our webinar yesterday, and I'm sure you will continue to experience, large town halls um, don't make for great one-on-one -on -one exchanges, right? We don't even have the luxury of sort of the hand up in the room and the nodding heads around to confirm. It's it's all sort of more isolated. So one way that is sort of practical that we can make sure that collaboration and um, sort of the latter stage uh, moments on the IAP2 spectrum are still meaningful is to be very selective uh, about who we're inviting in. and. If that means running social media ads that ask people to declare an opinion one way or another, and then diving back into that group with invitations, whether that's via social media or via text message or via telephone uh, to fill out surveys, that's, that's an effective way of, of structuring the early stages of the spectrum. Identify your audience, identify their position on an issue, and this may require uh, contacting them several times 
to sort of Venn diagram out their commitments, and then picking from among those groups who we want to invite to more intimate, albeit virtual, meetings and collaborative sessions. So, um, and one thing that, that matters a great deal is that if the digital gives us the chance to get to people where they are, we're not actually just talking about platforms and channels, we're talking about where they are in a conversation. And social media and a lot of digital technologies give us a lot of data back from using them. And um, if we're able to, to listen, to use a lot of these tools as listening mechanisms as much as communications mechanisms, so not just speaking to, but hearing from, then we're able to position how we're inviting people and how we're progressing them through the increasingly intimate and collaborative aspects of our practice. Now, on the next slide, um, I think uh, this is this is language that that is not native to your uh, to your practice, but this is um, a, a good way of thinking about uh, an increasingly rich and an increasingly intimate uh, engagement with a person uh, digitally. And so the path to purchase is language borrowed directly from from marketing speak. Um, but what it's meant to illustrate is the different touch points through which people have to pass in order to act vis-a-vis -a, -vis a brand. Uh, advocate here, um, we might think of as just a, a marketing watchword for deepening the engagement or re-engaging. And so is standing in here for the latter parts of the, the, the P2 spectrum. Um, if people need to learn about what's going on, then they need to consider the value of what's going on before they, they buy or before they act in any way and they need to have success or a positive experience of those first three arrows before they will do something like re-engage um, or become a brand advocate or a deeper participant in a consultation. So if we're thinking about sort of a hierarchy of considerations, always think of your engagement objective first. Let that structure the touch point you need in order to reach your your people. Uh, if that touch point is best served over email, boom, you've got your channel chosen. If it's best served over social media or if it's best served over a virtual meeting space or a working group or a chat, then you've got your channel as well. Uh, if we know it's a social media channel that we're, we're pursuing, uh, then that allows us to choose a platform based on our objective and the outcome we're seeking. And if we've chosen Twitter as the platform we're using, we've got to make sure our content syncs up and that any tools we're using local to Twitter make sense in the context of the engagement we're seeking. So if we know we're looking for a Twitter audience, we might look at using tools like polls or uh, Periscope live events. If we know that we're reaching people via email, we know that we've got a little more latitude, but that the intimacy of the experience is perhaps paramount, and we need to give people a chance to act based on what they've learned in the email. And if we're using a tool like MailChimp, for example, in order to effectively segment our audience and deliver custom emails that are highly personalized and highly actionable to people, it behooves us to be using the data that comes back from the digital experience. So what are we learning and what measurement tools do we have in place? And one thing we didn't talk a lot about uh, on, the, on the live version that I think bears mention here is that for every tool, there is a second tool we have to consider. And that is, that is the analytical tool. And most and most good ones, certainly all good ones, uh, tools in the digital space have robust uh, analytics platforms associated with them that allow us to track not just what we're doing but how it's working and so our our opportunities to pivot and adapt are there right in front of us but that is that's a that's a super important piece of using any tool is to to measure how it's being used and measure how it's helping you pursue your objective and Michael, I'm, this is Kim here speaking, everyone. I just wanted to chime in um, for all of our listeners. I think what we really wanted to offer in these first two slides is that we're trying to give you questions you should be asking providers, these online, whether they're online tools, they're online platforms, whatever it is, 
because we know that there are so many out there, we wanted to give you some sort of key questions or things that you should have as a list in front of you. Many of these providers or, or platforms, not so much in the social media space, but in the paid services, all have sales teams. And we encourage you to call all of them or call the ones that are first striking you. You can go to this um, a collection of ideas that are coming from the IAP2 community that we can make reference to later and reach out to some of those different vendors or organizations and use some of these questions or considerations that we're offering in these slides to help you think about um, making the right choice for these tools. So Michael, I'll let you carry on. Here's the next slides. Absolutely, and, and I think just riffing off that, Kim, um, typically choose the free tool first, try to use it, and if it's not fitting your needs, you'll have a rubric for assessing what you want to hear from that sales team. That's very good advice. Um, so if it's a podcast, get comfortable with, with the media available for producing a podcast. Now, I've, I've talked a little bit more about, um, you know, how to invite, you know, how to distribute that, you know, to an effective, uh, distributed effectively to a relevant audience. But I think, you know, start with GarageBand on, on your, on your MacBook. And if you need something more out of that, then you know what to ask the sales teams at Alitu, for example, and whether or not you need those publishing functions. But that's that's a good point. And just as we're going here, Amelia, I know we didn't start at our official time. Could you just give us a quick time check as to how much time we have left for our session here? Thanks, Kim. Yes, you have about uh, probably about 20 more minutes, 20, 25 more minutes. Okay, thanks, Amelia. So one thing to consider as moving forward, and I'll be I'll be quick uh, before I pass it off to Chris. Um, if we're in the digital space, we are by definition up against a lot of competition. People are doing a lot online. For example, there are something like 200 million emails sent globally every minute. So you're, it, it behooves you to think about who you're talking to and in what way and how you're proposing value to them right off the top. Uh, one thing we don't want is to move to a digital space and then have um, have a failure to to have people engage with our content because it's lost in the sea that's out there. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, good content uh, and good targeting of that content uh, on the social media side is important and um, making sure that you're being very clear about uh, the value and the ease. You want to reduce friction for people joining webinars, joining sessions, uh, or collaborating. If, if we're reducing friction, then we're, we're cutting through a lot of that noise and we're making it easier for people to engage. And that's, that's really what we care about. Chris? Thanks, Michael. So to bring this to ground a bit, um, because I think the insights that Michael have provided are interesting and valuable, but they are, we will admit, from a slightly different context, you know, thinking about uh, digital marketing um, and, and other spaces, but the application is very relevant. I know everyone on this uh, call that we're listening in to this webinar recorded will be very familiar with the IEP2 spectrum. Uh, it's a tool that I use often in my work. I consult it to consider uh, the level of decision making uh, that I want to target in my processes, but also for inspiration, for tactical opportunities to connect uh, with stakeholders. And and the spectrum has offered that, you know, focused on in-person touch points. And we thought it would be a useful exercise. And this is by no means um, comprehensive or 100%, you know, the right thing. We're really just starting to work with it, but wanted to map some of the digital engagement opportunities that we've been talking about to the spectrum. Again, we've we've mentioned this a number of times. There are just so many tools out there uh, that you know we've we've identified a few here that Michael has mentioned, like Mailchimp, like SurveyMonkey, and of course like Facebook and Engagement HQ and Zoom. But for every one of these tools that we mentioned, there are probably you know five, 10, 20 competitors to them. So lots of options and opportunity, lots of you know uh, scalability in terms of uh, price, um, size of audience it can accommodate, and of course functionality and what it can do for you and your P2 process. 
So what I will, you know, just uh, offer here that I think is is helpful is that, you know, we have had so many great contributions from the IEP2 community, as been previously mentioned, all kinds of tools that maybe many of us didn't know existed or are being used to really great impact uh, for online processes. I think that this could be something that we continue to evolve and, and give guidance as, as a tool, you know, for members to think about what is out there um, and, and what can be leveraged for various engagement objectives in your processes. And Michael, maybe, I don't know if there are a few more that you wanna kind of draw out here in terms of things to be thinking about or enhanced functionality along the spectrum. Um, sure, absolutely. I think, um, you know, things like Engagement HQ are, 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 are very powerful tools. Um, there are a lot of a lot of tools that do surveys. SurveyMonkey is great. Google has uh, has a survey tool, Google Forms, which allow you to develop uh, surveys and distribute them basically for free. Um, as you've seen, you know something like uh, GoToWebinar or Zoom. I'm sure you've experienced recently is is good for certain types of town hall or certain types of presentation. Uh, but there are there are solutions like Slido, for example, that um, that allow breakout sessions, that allow uh, a lot of in-depth polling and audience participation. And if that's something that that you need, um, it does come at a cost. Uh, and that, of course, that cost is related to number of participants, but also um, number of surveys, number of breakout groups, and things like that. Slido is certainly worth checking out. Um, it, text messages, right? And especially if we're thinking, as I suggested earlier, that, that the digital um, exists outside the internet as well, and your audience may not have ready access, especially in remote communities, to uh, to the sort of high bandwidth required to do um, virtual town halls and things. Um, solutions like Hustle, which is um, really quite involved. Uh, there are sort of um, some more affordable versions, less enterprisey versions of Hustle uh, that allow you to send uh, text messages to to groups and um, and sort of plan and sequence those in um, really interesting ways. Um, and know, Michael, I might just jump in here. I know that we're running close on time, so maybe last last thought or two on a on the last tool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Listen, personal favorite of mine is, is Slack. And I think um, once we've identified a group that we wanna work on something either collaboratively with or um, you know, to, to share information and to, to advance a consultation and to advance an engagement, there are very few tools that are as cost effective and as multi-purpose as, as Slack. And they, the key feature there is um, that it allows an internal and an external channel. So you can manage a project with, with your co-presenters or with your co-collaborators and you can have a public face of that channel. Um, that's really great because it, it, it connects so many things all at once. Um, but you know, as a, as a final, final thought, uh, Google's got a lot of products that work very, very well. If you can't use those, there are, there are alternatives. Microsoft has some if you're in a government organization. Um, but uh, you know, the, the good old fashioned spreadsheet that you're sharing um, can, can be useful here as well. But think about what works for you and think about how it's working to advance the increasingly intimate and increasingly collaborative uh, steps up the ladder. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Everyone, we wanted to offer a really tangible moment here. Um, many of you are, might be facing a situation like this where up until now you had been developing, let's say, a master plan for your community's waterfront area, or you might be saying like you're planning major infrastructure for an urban area, or you're trying to gather input for an upcoming budget cycle, sort of insert the type of engagement that you were planning Let's pretend for a moment that you were working at the consult level on IAP2 spectrum and that your original engagement plan included an, op or an online survey, maybe a few uh, open houses and a series of pop-up community events, that being like you're going to events that were already occurring and taking your engagement there. Now, you can't do two of those three things that you were imagining. You can probably still run your online survey, but you can't do your other face-to-face -face activities. Um, Chris, maybe just um, chime in here for a moment. Thoughts or ideas, if people had this in front of them or something like this, 
what could they do now? What online tools could they look to that might replace this experience that we were talking about? Hmm. Thanks so much, Kim. And what I'd offer here is in addition to replacing the in-person experience, we can also think about enhancing uh, what was already planned. So for example, the online survey, I immediately think with a community master plan, a lot of people are really interested in what that might look like. Uh, so we could consider leveraging uh, Facebook or Twitter and doing some geo-targeted uh, paid promotional posts just to let people know, hey, this conversation is happening and we were hoping to do an open Open house and, and share, you know, um, and capture your ideas. But go to this place uh, online instead and fill out our survey or, um, you know, contribute to the discussion there. Um, I think that's a, an interesting way to leverage the channels people are spending time um, and to be really focused on the area of impact and who might care about this and to get a message in front of their eyeballs that this is a conversation that's happening and that we're inviting them to, uh, to participate and contribute. So that's one thought that came to mind for me. And that's entirely possible. Uh, you know, Facebook has great audience targeting right down to the postal code level. Thanks, Chris. Everyone, I'm gonna throw in a couple of ideas here as well um, to, um, because you can't have your open house, because you can't do your pop-up events, um, there might be an opportunity to, let's say you pre-record a five or seven minute video. This could be done easily with your phone. Um, Zoom has recording capabilities, or you could work with a videographer potentially to do this. So let's say you record a short, here's some information you need to know about what we were going to be talking about. And then you invite people over, let's say a series of days, Let's say you invite them for about a 45 minute to maybe an hour conversation that takes place online. So rather than coming together in person, you actually host, whether it is on Zoom, I think GoToMeeting also has some applications. There are probably other online. Um, Google Hangout has an experience like this where you invite people and actually have an interactive experience where you share the video, you can ask people discussion questions. And so you are actually taking what would have happened in an online space and you put it, or sorry, what would have happened in an in-person space and have it happen uh, online. So just wanted to put that out there as well too. It would be new and different for our planners as well as our organizers. And I think that there is opportunities to, to do that. And Michael, one last one, and then I can, I know I need to go to our last couple of uh, pieces of information. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's great. We can think of pop-up events as possible in the digital space. Uh, one thing that I've seen used for um, to great effect is uh, uh, an ask me anything. And whether that's being done over a Facebook Live or through a platform like Reddit, um, those make for uh, for very good pop-up style events that are interactive by definition. Um, one might think if, you know, if the, if the method of inviting people to an open house would have been standing on the waterfront with a clipboard collecting email addresses, um, we can do, as Chris suggested, geo-targeting uh, in, in order to, um, and, and perhaps we don't have people on the waterfront right now, but people who are, you know, demonstrate a proxy for being a stakeholder. They have property nearby, they own a boat, that sort of thing. Invite um, invite them to, to these events. Um, one thing also uh, that the digital allows us to do, and this will be my last thought here, uh, is, is to have those real-time conversations, those events that say take 45 minutes or an hour of presentation, but also to, uh, to diffuse that interaction over time. And this is perhaps a little more technical, but something like, Facebook Messenger, which is a free platform, if that's associated with a project page or a business page that you're using, um, there are now relatively cheap things like chatbots that will allow a um, an approximation of a real conversation, but can do a lot to collect data from your audience. So if people are, hey, I have this concern, hey, I've got this question, you can walk them through a sequence uh, and people are getting more and more used to dealing with machines for things like this. Um, I think so long as we're foregrounding the value that this is a contribution they're making or um, this is this is their voice inside a consultation, they won't mind doing that. Um, but they can do it 
once the kids have gone to bed. They can do it at two in the morning. They can do it uh, from the bathroom if they'd like. There's no need to to make. You know, there's no need to keep thinking about uh, those collaborative social events as having to happen all at the same time. We can we can um, we can space out that back and forth uh, by using things like messenger technology, things like Slack, as I've mentioned. Um, and that's uh, that's my thought on that. Thanks, Michael. Amelia, I'm going to do one more check-in with you, everyone, around time. And I just want to say to all of our listeners, I'm trying to model here a little bit what you would do when you are doing an in when you're doing a live event like this. Is I can't see Amelia, and I don't know what's going on on the other side. And so it's entirely okay to let your audience know what's going on. Invite them sort of into the invite them into what's happening here. So Amelia, give me one last time check, and then I'll know how much time I have left. You have, <clears throat> sorry, Kim, you have 10 minutes. If we need to go over by five minutes, we can, but you've got 10 minutes within the hour. Thanks, Amelia. I appreciate that. So everyone, here's the last piece. Um, we know that there were many questions in addition to which tool should I choose? And we've offered some context around what do you need to think about in order to pick the right tool. People were also asking questions around, so once you sh once people show up, online or they're in a space with you in the online how do you create a positive experience or how do you facilitate online when you can't always see people's faces or maybe they're only on on audio so we really want to spend just a few minutes thinking about tools can bring people together but it's the the humans that are in the room that create the experience I know my work has for a long time been influenced by this beautiful Maya Angelou quote where she talks about, I'm not going to read it word for word, but essentially people might forget what you said. They might even forget what you did, but they rarely or never forget how you, how you made them feel. And so I think as community conveners, as hosters of important high stakes conversations, that the feeling that we leave people with matters just as much as the data or the input or the feedback that we collect, because it's actually the thing that will bring people back around again to your next conversation. And so I have a few ideas around what do we need to consider in order to create a quality experience for people. And whether that's physically in a room, I think all these same concepts apply in that online space. And so we need to think about people's physical experience. What are they gonna see? What are they gonna smell, touch, taste, hear? Now the trickiest part is that in general, we have very little control in the online space of smell, or touch or taste, but we can influence things like see, or we can influence things like hear, and we could invite people to, let's say, bring things with them to the online space. So, you know, make sure that you're inviting people to bring a glass of water with them or, you know, grab a snack from the fridge before you, you know, settle in with, your, you know, a cup of tea, that sort of thing. So there are ways that we can still encourage people to create a comfortable physical space before they sit down and, and they engage with us. I think also as keepers or conveners of conversations, we need to think about the intellectual experience that people have. And this by this I mean that how are people going to make meaning of what's in front of them or what's being presented. And so often in a room, we've got things like flip charts and we have diagrams on walls or we might have maps. And this helps people both process information and organization as providing, as well as help make sense of what participants might be sharing or offering. We're gonna need to consider that in the online space. So how are you going to share that information? How much are you going, how much are you going to share? So a couple of things that I would encourage you to do, uh, some of the things that I'm learning as I go here are make sure you have some sort of technology moment at the outset where you, especially if you're using some sort of tool like GoToWebinar or Zoom that you show people, here's how you turn on your webcam, here's how you turn it off, here's where the chat or question box feature is. Here's how you quote unquote raise your hand. Most of these tools have um, items that people can use to get uh, to interact, but if they've never used them before, they're going to be uncomfortable. So let's create space for that technology moment. 
I think there's also an opportunity to create some technology testing periods beforehand. That's something that our team had done and then was woefully disappointed when it didn't quite work out um, later in the call, but nevertheless, important to try and to test. The last thing that I'll say here, everyone, about that intellectual experience is knowing people probably only have about a 45 minute maybe a 60 or 90 minute attention span in that online space if you're having active discussion, the flow or the arc of your event matters just like it would in a face-to-face -face event. So how you bring people on the call, how you welcome and greet them, how you bring them into the meat of the discussion and how you leave them at the end are all quite important. Lastly, everyone here, and this one is definitely near and dear to my heart and my practice, um, is that what is the emotional experience? What do people feel or how are they impacted by the conversation or the discussion that you're inviting them to? This is the part of where we build trust. This is the part where we build relationships or mend relationships that weren't there. Public engagement or community engagement is rarely simple or easy. We're not talking to people about stuff that doesn't matter. We're talking about things that impact people's livelihoods or their communities or, the, or any other thing that's important to people. So what they experience in a room, whether that be online room or an in-person room, really matters. And so I want you to think about the communications that you send out before people get into that online space. How are you inviting them? How are you supporting them to interact in new and different ways? How are pe people being welcomed on a call? For me, it's wherever I can that my video is on and people see my face, not the minute that the call is starting, but as they're entering the room, the room, you can't see my fingers, they're in air quotes right now, how are we inviting them in? And then last but not least, everyone in this emotional experience is I really want you to think about, and we learned so strongly yesterday, this great practice of how can we, when things don't go the way that we expect them to, or everything that we had planned is somewhat going sideways, that we create from that experience, rather than reacting to it. And so there's just a bit of kind of go with what's in front of you right now and lean in to your participants and invite them into like, so this isn't going the way that I was expecting it to go or the way we had planned. And so, you know, let me check in on what others are experiencing or here's how I think we're gonna change or pivot and take it into another direction. So just to bring a close to that everyone is that I really want you to think about as you're planning events that you think about or those online events or convening people on online tools that you consider still the physical experience, the intellectual experience, and the emotional experience. So to bring us to a close, everyone, is that uh, we were going to ask for, for questions and, and that sort of thing. And so, Amelia, let me check back in with you here for a moment to see, um, were there any specific questions that we want to have answered here? Or did we want to just offer some of our learnings from our last, from our call yesterday? So I think that there's some ongoing questions that we continue to get. Uh, we got it both in session number one yesterday and also in session number two. Privacy is a big issue. How do we respect people's privacy? And, and that means like, how do we bring them online? How do we then collect data from them and things like that? So, so privacy is a big one. Perhaps the other biggest one out there is how do we truly continue to be inclusive? How do we reach people that are maybe slightly more difficult to reach? And if we're reaching out to them, how do we think about their sensitivities to perhaps not having a lot of experience with technology or cultural sensitivities? I know those are two big questions, but if there's any thoughts from any of you on answering either or both of those questions, that would be appreciated. We've probably got only about three, four minutes to answer those questions, because then I know we want to go into a bit of a debrief, but um, Kim, maybe we'll start with you and then maybe turn to Chris and Mike, uh, Michael, just in case they've got thoughts on those. Mm -hmm. I'll just say, um, I, 
three or four minutes to how do we address barriers to online participation? <laughs> I feel like this could be a webinar all in itself. Um, everyone, I think this is really where any information or um, insight wisdom you've collected in past engagement processes about people saying, hey, here's what we actually needed or hear some ideas on ways to reach people that you missed in that last conversation. We should be mining, looking at past experiences to see what we can, we can learn there. I think that these are opportunities of where we lean into our community partners or our other, um, uh, you know, maybe key stakeholders who can give us insight into, we know that we historically or traditionally missed this group, tell us you know give us ideas suggestions so my best advice here everyone two pieces go back to what you already know sometimes it's so easy to forget and move on to new projects so lean back into things you've already learned bring those to the surface lean in to community partners or you know leaders that are inside of the communities that we are trying to re reach to see you know pick up the phone here was a great opportunity to talk to them and see what insight and wisdom they could offer on how we could improve reaching those people that we so often can miss. Chris and Mike, I'll turn it over to you. I'll add something that came up yesterday that I thought was really valuable. Um, of course, this conversation is focused on the digital space and online tools, um, but Kim, you pointed this out. There are still some other options, uh, maybe you know, old tools in the toolbox that we could go back to that we know have worked really well. Um, so you know, there are ways to connect with people by telephone. There are a number of people who still have landlines, or most of us have cell phones. Maybe that's a way to make that connection if you know the online experience is not optimal for participants, or uh, you know, smaller dialogues or workbooks. Um, we can think about you know, a broader suite of tactics that maybe help us reach those more difficult to reach audiences or those who might not as engage uh, as comfortably on digital. Uh, someone had a great idea about um, a direct mailer. Um, we used to do those all the time, right? And it can be a paper survey or whatever the case may be, but we can, we can be creative and think more broadly about uh, how we can reach folks and how we can get them involved in our processes. That's great. Um, I actually, I, I'll touch back on the mailer issue uh, or the mailer suggestion in just a sec, but I think just running quickly through these, uh, these, these three questions, the right and the best tools are the ones that your audience is already using. Um, and, you know, figure that out. Because if, if you have to ask them to adapt to a new tool, you're, you're setting the participation back uh, one step at least. Um, Barriers to online participation. I think a big one sticking within the digital space here is um, make sure that whatever tool you're using works on a mobile device and is even better designed for a mobile experience. That's the way people are using the internet. And um, that's it, it's a cheap device that does several, um, several different jobs for people. Um, and uh, if we can if we can scab our practice on to uh, onto tool use, like the use of a mobile device, then, then we're ahead of the game. How do we protect data and privacy? Um, we are honest about what we want from people and disclosive about how we're collecting it and what we're doing with it. So have a policy and disclose that policy. People will opt in when those policies are clear. They'll opt in without even thinking. But you want to make sure that whatever you're doing with their data is disclosed to them. Um, and if, if it's a question of collecting phone numbers so you can call them up and do a survey over the telephone, make sure they know that. Um, in, in my experience as a marketer, direct mailers are incredibly powerful. And that's as a digital marketer I'm speaking here. But where those work best is when that beautiful experience of getting something in the mail from someone you trust is um, as, as pristine as possible. So bulk mailers going to people you don't know very ineffective, have a very low response rate. Direct mail going to people that are already qualified leads, or if you will, people who are halfway down a, um, a, 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 um, on engagement are very, very effective. There's, there's beautiful intimacy there and you get a lot out of people, but target, 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 and use digital tools in as much as possible to figure out how to engage offline. Thanks very much, Michael. 
Um, I know we're running out of time, so I'd like to turn it now to um, the lessons that have been learned over the past 24 hours, um, specifically as we ran the uh, session yesterday. And, and Kim, I don't know if you can turn to the picture of all three of you so that I know we can't use our video cams at the moment, but it would be nice to see you all. Um, I'm going to come to all of you. Um, maybe I'll, I will uh, start with Kim and then quickly turn to Chris and Mike, and I'll, I'll finish with just some thoughts and reflections on how, how do you make changes quickly? How can you be nimble? Kim. Two things I'll offer everyone, and they link together with each other. Uh, I, after yesterday's experience, and I think I knew this before, and maybe just didn't, wasn't, wasn't quite there yet. I think we should just go in expecting the technology is going to fail or somewhere along the way that it might let us down. Now, if it doesn't, awesome, so much better that it didn't. But I think if I had had the mindset of this might go sideways or this might not go quite the way that I was expecting to, I think my heart and my mind, my sort of presenter mind would have been in a different place had I been not expecting that thing to be exactly the way that it was, which bleeds into my second thought of, um, I've been spending a lot of time talking with organizations around let's we have so many expectations about how things are going to go, and we tie in our intentions and our hopes so closely to those uh, expectations. And in a time of unprecedented, uncertain, turbulent uh, situation, we almost have to let go of some of those expectations because they're going to be different than anything we've experienced before. So how can we in this engagement space support ourselves to let go of some expectations and live in a state of expectancy where we believe that amazing things can come from discussion and conversation with people, but maybe not holding quite so tightly to those expectations. So I'll leave that for, I'll leave that there. Chris, I'll turn it over to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think I'd add to that that uh, one of my key takeaways is that I wasn't prepared for my own feelings of uh, the technology failing us. And um, it's something that I've been reflecting on because I think, you know, that, that can be very um, disappointing. It's disappointing for the participants. It's disappointing for the presenters and the organizers uh, who thought they had a, you know, a foolproof plan going in to a session, but, you know, the technology uh, thought and, and acted otherwise. Um, and coming out of that, it's important for all of us uh, and for me personally to remember just what I've learned from the experience and to be adaptable and to have that plan B. And if it doesn't work the way we, we quite expected it to work, that's okay because, you know, the model here is to try to, you know, adapt, uh, sometimes to fail. I think we will, you know, uh, from time to time, but we're, we're learning and we're evolving. And, um, you know, we're, we're in a world right now where everyone's trying to figure out this, this new normal, as we've called it, and, and how we're going to, you know, collaborate and connect in our communities and on our projects and with our colleagues. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, an interesting time. And I think there's more learnings than anything from, from yesterday's experience that I'll bring into other projects. Thanks, Chris. Mike. Uh, one thing I'll say is that it's a lot easier to re-record a virtual uh, meeting <laughs> than it is to uh, reconvene um, a, a town hall that's in a school gym, for example. And I think um, there, there's a lesson there that that if we're doing things digitally, we have to be prepared to iterate, iterate, iterate. Um, I mean, it's been the watchword of Silicon Valley forever that you try something and fail fast, um, but of course be in a position to learn from that. And uh, I think digital tools give us the chance at a second crack, um, uh, much more so than, than a lot of traditional ones. That's not to say that's a reason for, for jumping in uh, head first, but I think uh, there's, there's some cold comfort to that, that um, that we always have a second chance campaign doesn't work, retarget it, town hall fails, try again. Um, so I think, uh, you know, and, and and be prepared to adapt on site. And I think one thing we did uh, yesterday, um, perhaps not perfectly, but one thing I think we did do was um, was, was roll with the punches and um, 
and, and, and change the way we were speaking, change the way we were pausing to give other people a chance. So be prepared to adapt to the realities of that new technical universe, if you will. Thanks, Michael. And and I guess my reflection is that, um, you know, sometimes your technology will tell you that you can have the thousand people on the line and perhaps in all sorts of good circumstances that can happen. Um, with the 920 people yesterday, it had a serious impact on our ability to deliver. So we quickly turned around for our second webinar and limited it to 600. In, and in that particular instance, we were able to deal with the technology and everything went smoothly. So I agree with everything that people are saying. Um, be okay to say things haven't gone as well as expected and perhaps do what we're doing today, re-record and give you a clean version. Also, try and see what you can do on the fly. But also remember, you might need to go back out and apologize and just say, you know what? This didn't quite way the way, work the way we had expected. We thank you so much for your patience. We are continuing to learn and hopefully we're continuing to improve. And we also hope that you come back. So my lesson, my lessons learned is, yeah, sometimes it's okay to fail. We felt that this was a fairly safe environment. We wanted to take you along with us through our process. So you saw a struggle, but hopefully all of you will have learned a little bit more as you subsequently go out to do your work. So with that, we're going to wrap up our re-recording of yesterday's webinar. I want to sincerely thank Kim, Chris, and Michael. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. To all of the, those of you that are on the line, I hope that you sincerely enjoyed today's uh, special webinar on adaptive technologies. Take care, bye-bye now.